you so much for joining us for this session. Um, I know there will be a few more people joining as we continue to get going, but I wanted to get us officially started. Um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Anna Wyeth. I'm the Director of Alumni Programs here at Sidwell Friends. I'm so excited uh, for this panel session featuring some insanely talented alumni uh, talking about their musical endeavors. Before we get officially started, just a couple quick housekeeping items. I would encourage you to change your Zoom name to include your class year. You can think about this like your virtual name tag. Just helps us all feel the full participation of everybody who is in the room. Um, and also, if you can just keep yourself on mute just to minimize disruptions, we will have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, as we go along, feel free to throw questions in the chat, um, or if you would like to ask your question, let me or Emma O'Leary, my colleague who's here helping to staff this, know, and we can um, get you, uh, get you, let you know when it's time to ask your question during the Q and A. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Neville Waters, class of '75, who is moderating this panel for us, and we'll get started. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. I'm really personally excited to. Um, be a part of this panel today. Um, these are some individuals that I know more by name as other fellow Black alums, but uh, I have uh, an insane appreciation for this business. Um, I was telling them earlier when we were doing our introductions and they will introduce themselves that uh, I, I wanted to establish my credibility. So I, I just ran down and I wanted to show I, I have a gold record, okay, <laughs> for, for LL Cool J, all right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm a real OG here. Uh, but anyway, um, I want to get started with introducing this panel. We're going to get into a lot of things. Hopefully, we will uh, stay within the constraints of an hour, but who knows? We, we might get wild and crazy and be here till tomorrow morning, you know? Um, but anyway, uh, if you could introduce yourself, tell us your class year, uh, tell us, you know, what you are doing currently, and if you, you know, or where you preside, if you're in the area or wherever else. Um, and uh, I'll start with you, Jason. Sure. Um, Jason Edwards, I'm class of 2004. Um, I currently reside in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. Um, I've lived in a bunch of other places interstitially, but mostly uh, returning to DC area. Um, I, uh, my music participation is uh, largely as a uh, composer, producer, um, and sometimes performer. I think that was a lot more uh, common before COVID. Um, I was doing more performing and touring. Um, have played with um, bands locally and also internationally. Um, but primarily my instruments are uh, drum, keys, um, and some other things, a little bit of bass, a little bit of guitar. Um, I don't play as well as John does, but um, that's primarily my instruments. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I, I think um, my my music world is a. Uh, I, I think Sidwell is really responsible for some of my uh, taking of music instrumentation seriously. Um, so that's kind of what I want to preface this with. All right, thank you much. There, uh, we'll go over to uh, Allison next. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Allison Cambridge, class of '97. Um, I currently reside in New York City, although I'm technically right now um, in Washington, D.C., because I'm hosting the Levine Music uh, School Gala tomorrow, <laughs> uh, virtually. Um, but I've been an international opera singer for 20 years, um, won the Metropolitan Opera Competition way back in the day. Um, and yeah, I've been singing opera around the world. Um, I've sung a lot at the Kennedy Center, the Met, Carnegie Hall, all over Europe and Asia. Um, and a few years ago, I also made my Broadway debut um, and uh, I've released four albums, classical and jazz. And I am, in addition to my normal performing career, I'm currently also uh, co-producing a new Broadway show called Rock Me Amadeus, which fuses opera and classical symphonic music with uh, pop, classic rock, hip hop, um, and it's a way to fuse all the genres together and make it cool and fun. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move over here to John, who I, from now on, I'm going to refer to as JD. <laughs> yeah, all my friends call me JD. So yeah, y'all are more than welcome to call me to JD. Um, my name is John Days, uh, class of 2005. Um, 
I am a musician producer. So mainly I do um, perform, but also do some recording as well and co-writing with other artists locally. Um, my main instruments are bass and guitar, little keys. Um, but um, yeah, that's kind of the general gist. Excited to be here. And last but certainly not least, Jamel. Yo, yo, what's happening, everybody? Uh, my name is Jamel Mims, uh, class of 04, 04 out here. Uh, I'm a bilingual rapper. I rap in Mandarin, Mandarin, Chinese, and in English. I'm a multimedia artist and a revolutionary. Uh, I got a Fulbright scholarship in 2008 to study hip hop in China and actually began studying Chinese at Sidwell. And so I think that's kind of where the thread really begins a bit here with tying it back to Sidwell. Um, I think in particular, what I've been working on since then and since the Fulbright has really been carving out this pathway between Black America and China in this conversation. In 2018, I was part of a project called Found Sound China that was a collaboration and residency between Chinese and American musicians uh, and tour. Uh, in 2019, I organized a, you know, um, independent tour of, of Taiwan, Hong Kong, and uh, seven different cities in uh, mainland China. Um, and then um, now, particularly in this moment, you know, both in the surge of this latest wave of protest around Black Lives Matter this summer, and in the course of these xenophobic attacks on Asian Americans, you know, the work that I've been doing to have these conversations amongst Chinese artists, Asian Americans, and Black Americans has really been, uh, you know, creating avenues for discussion, but then also really pushing the limits of identity politics, both in music and in like holding conversation. You know, we really need to have solidarity, but on a basis of getting rid of this system that this, that divides us. Um, so I'll start there, but that's me. Jamel, that's, that's a, actually, I'm gonna come back to you because that's a, a great jumping off point for where I wanted to go. But I was gonna tell you one, you got a better hairdo than the weekend. And I appreciate the Fred Hampton uh the 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 drop there that's that's great but i was going to ask you and then you were starting to talk about this uh where do you find the, the inspiration for your work i mean what what in what has inspired you and, and and how do you hope that your work uh is received yeah i mean i i think i definitely want to you know shout out from being on this panel the um and definitely connected to the folks here jason and jd you know uh, I remember going to, you know, Tinley Town, getting, you know, chased out of like, you know, chased out of Tinley Town by MTA police, you know, while we're like going to CD exchange to go look at and dig into a Tribe Called Quest and really like go over and pour over these albums. Um, and I think there was a, both a real connection that was fostered in terms and an appreciation of music. Um, but I think in terms of what keeps me inspired or what, you know, what what's the impact that I hope my work has on the world is, you know, I write music and write work and create art from a place of a future society where humanity has actually been emancipated, where we've gotten beyond capitalism, imperialism, and the shackles that it actually puts on us, you know, and how do we actually bring people into that? And how do we bring people into that world? How do we provoke, challenge, and inspire? And, you know, um, I take a lot of inspiration. Um, there's a revolutionary leader named Baba Vakian who's done a lot of work in terms of excavating like both the truth and history of the Chinese revolution and how it relates to what we're going on now, but then also has actually, you know, figured out how that relates with culture. And, you know, I take a lot of inspiration both from his work and from just the very fact that it doesn't have to be this way. And when you see, especially things like last summer and, you know, uh, where a time where millions of people are raising their heads, you know, that's a time that calls, I think, on all artists to kind of act. Um, both to lend our platforms, our support, um, but then also to really drive people into doing what's necessary to, to get rid of this. So um, I think that's what really kind of keeps me consistently inspired. No, you're going to the, the real soul of the struggle to, to play off the, the title of the panel. Uh, Allison, you were talking about the things that you're doing and I think you know, kind of tying in multiple genres. Uh, obviously that, 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 that to me seems pretty creative and innovative. Um, so how do you, uh, how would you like that to be impacted or, or what are you trying to do with that? Um, I'll answer that kind of in two parts. Um, as a creator and as a producer now of a show, um, and you know, because it was sort of born out of the idea of another show that had existed before, 
now being a woman of color who's creating and producing this show, I'm bringing in a different lens than the former producers. It was very, when you brought in new cast members for this show, for example, it was important for me for it to be a very diverse cast. Um, and so, you know, I was, there was two of us um, in the last show of color. And in this one, it's a much more diverse cast. And the voc the vocalism that's represented in the show is also wider range. We have a soul singer, we have an R&B singer, we have, um, we have somebody actually who can rap now in the show, which was not part of it before. And so that was part of, I mean, that's how I'm able to put like my finger, my stamp on this moving forward. Um, and I said to our, to my co-creator and co-producer, I said, we need to make this more uh, musically um, inclusive in terms of all the different genres. So that's my producer creator hat. But as an opera singer, I mean, for the most part, I sing the music of dead white men. That is, I mean, that is opera, right? So much of it was composed, you know, hundreds of years ago. And the opera world in general has been, a, I mean, from when I started was a very homogeneous place. And I was often the only woman of color of any color <laughs> um, in a cast. And I am very happy to say that that has changed over the years, I'd say within the past five to seven, that has gotten better, but it has to start from the top down. And so we still have the casting directors, the artistic administrators, the boards, all tend to be not of color. And so a lot of my colleagues and myself were really working to try and change that. This year of the pandemic, as an opera singer, for, so my 2020-2021 season was going to be so unique in that I was supposed to have been portraying four iconic African-American women in opera. That's unheard of. I was supposed to be at the Kennedy Center um, in the spring singing Bess and Porgy and Bess. I was supposed to be portraying Sally Hemings in from the Diary of Sally Hemings. I was gonna be playing Julie in uh, Showboat who is of mixed race and it becomes exposed that she's of mixed race. And then most recently, I was supposed to be playing Coretta, Coretta Scott King in a new opera called I Dream about the last 36 hours of, of Martin Luther King's life. And all of that got canceled or postponed. But in my 20 years of being in this industry, I have never had that opportunity within a, what's the season, the opera season, it's like nine, 10 months, to portray four African-American characters in opera. And so I am enthused to see a change coming and to see more people like us represented and our stories on stage, but there's still a long way to go. You're muted, you're muted. I have to follow up. Uh, did you find resistance within the sort of the opera industry to what you were trying to do as, as a producer? Are you kidding me? So when I made my day, my Broadway debut in 2018, I was at the same time singing at the Metropolitan Opera in another show. Um, and I was splitting, I was going back and forth between rehearsals for the two shows. And whenever I would leave the Met, you know, people, oh, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I'm starring in this new show on Broadway that does, does, does and they were like, are you kidding me? You're totally selling out. Um, that's not real opera. The fact that you're fusing it with like rock and pop. And I was like, no, no, no. I'm using my talents as an opera singer in the exact same way. I just happen to be introducing it to a totally different audience and they're hearing it and being exposed to it in a different musical experience. It does not cheapen what I am doing. And people really turned their nose up at it. And here we are two and a half, almost three years later. And people are like, yes, <laughs> more of this, more of this, especially because the opera industry has just been, it's struggling. And they frankly need to find a way to make it more, to keep it relevant and interesting and bring in newer and more diverse audiences. So yes, they were snobs about it, but they're coming around. <laughs> no, I, you know, it's funny. I, I have to share one personal story of my own uh, artistic endeavors. When I was at Sidwell, we did the play A Raisin in the Sun, and I had a role in that play. 
Uh, I was the, the, the son, very small role. But it, it, they did a revival on Broadway a few years back where uh, uh, Diddy, where Puffy played the, the role of the, the father or whatever. Yes. I mean, Puffy's not the greatest actor, but, but it was amazing to me to see the audience that came to see that play because he was in it. It was incredibly diverse. You know, folks in their sweats, hoodies, whatever. I mean, they're representing who they are. It was so wonderful to see that. Um, and to your point, when you sort of open this up to others, it, 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 it becomes a sort of an inspiration in and of itself. Um, yeah, people feel, yeah. yeah, people feel, they feel welcome. They're a little bit disarmed because they may think, oh, I'm coming here to hear a rock concert, a pop concert, a hip hop, whatever. And then all of a sudden you get hit over the head with this surprise of like opera. And it's like, whoa, I did not expect to enjoy this in this setting. And yes, it brings along a new audience. I think the whole disarming factor is, is so important. Um, and, and yeah, no, exactly what you're saying. There's, if there's a way to reach new audiences and people um, by doing that, it's, it's the way to go. Yeah. So JD, I'm gonna come to you and ask you, you know, where, where do you find your inspiration for your work? Um, you know, do you just go outside and, you know, look at the, the beautiful sunshine or uh, are you writing about heartache? Uh, are, are, you, are you like a Drake, you know, every time <laughs> you, know, you do something, you want to go kill yourself, you know? I mean, what? Oh, man. Where, where do you find inspiration? Um, so I primarily work as like a musician and producer. So I have the luxury, I guess, of collaborating with a number of different artists. Um, and so I get the luxury of also like kind of choosing who I get to work with. And I most often find myself working with um, black artists who are kind of outside of like the norm of what, you know, people would expect black artists to create. Um, so I think like that's kind of my biggest inspiration, like working with, you know, black artists who kind of doing their own thing. Like, you know, they're okay being like different and they're used to kind of often being like the only black person in the room or the only black one in the room. And um, I think that really is what fuels my creativity. Um, just like, you know, being in these spaces where I'm like one of few black folks and we're kind of creating our own like space and doing things that like, you know, black folks created back in the day. Like, you know, you know, we made rock and roll, we made blues, but like, you know, we don't, you know, at least like in my experience, like working as a working musician, like we often don't see black, you know, folks in these spaces, like doing this sort of music. So, you know, I think that's like really inspiration, kind of like channeling that, that, uh, channeling that spirit. And then also like understanding, like there are folks before us who made this music and like understanding that legacy and kind of building upon that. I think that's like the biggest um, inspiration for me personally. Now, when you were at Sidwell, do you remember what you, what you used to groove to back then? Oh man. So, so we were in, uh, me and Jason were in jazz band with Dave Merlin Jones. And so uh, I think like the biggest, thing that we like me and jason especially connected on was grooving to like herbie hancock and the headhunters music um the first tune me and jason actually played together was a uh, watermelon man so i remember that groove and thinking like okay this is my guy right here um but like and ha the luxury of, like having that space to kind of like work through like you know jazz funk tunes was like really incredible and there's a great like kind of breeding ground for creativity well that bridge is right into you jason um he mentioned uh, the Davy Marilyn Jones, who I, I honestly I, I'm only familiar with by name. Uh, I think he, he, his time sort of comes after mine. Can you elaborate a little bit on on what on his role? Sure. Um, I at the time I started playing in the uh, in the jazz band so well. Um, I started my sophomore year. My freshman year actually was uh, too timid to audition. So uh, I had been taking private lessons on piano, um, but have been playing drums just kind of self-taught. Um, I remember once just kind of sitting at a kit and going, I think I can make this work. And having watched drummers and, you know, some of the drummers that uh, John references, like the Headhunters, uh, the drummer on record, not the touring drummer, the drummer on record is Harvey Mason. I remember just looking at, you know, this is early YouTube days, looking at videos and online, you know, videos of, you know, drummers like Harvey Mason and going, what they're doing is amazing and incredible and I want to try to do that. Um, and I think Dave Merlin Jones is a person that, um, you know, I would call an ally in the truest sense of the word, 
um, had made space for students to explore that without it becoming um, like niche or uh, um, in some ways kind of like the way that white people oftentimes treat black music is like as a study, like anthropologically. Um, and I don't, I don't really like that. Um, but it was very organically about the music. He's talking about what chord changes to play here and what to do here and what to do there. So um, I auditioned actually in a little closet in the art center. It's now been torn down. Uh, where the Black Box Theater currently is, it was a tiny little closet in the corner where the drum kit was set up. And I was like, you know, I haven't played like, you know, with lessons, but I think I know what I'm doing. And Dave says, go sit in the closet and play. And so we he stands behind me in this closet. And he tells the story now. I was like, that seems a little weird that we still in like five by five foot closet. Um, and I basically, he said, I right, play this, play this, play that. Okay. And I just played. And, and I think that that was the first time I had a teacher um, who, uh, I mean, I think, so I started playing in the more classical tradition uh, for piano. And I think what Allison mentioned kind of resonates with me about this idea of kind of a closed canon of old dead white man stuff. And there is a difficulty in, I think, finding myself and what that music was. And I believe that I had kind of always felt that the things that I was playing with my piano lessons weren't reflecting who I was as a person. It wasn't reflecting what I would listen on the radio, not the records that my dad listened to. It wasn't any of that. It was kind of a separate thing. Um, you know, we still listen to classical music in the house growing up, but that was not the primary, you know, bulk of what I listened to. So I think it was cool that Dave was saying, play what you want to play and play songs the way that you want to play them. He gave us sometimes chances to arrange tunes the way we wanted to. So that was the first time I ever had a band leader tell me, I trust your judgment enough to arrange this tune in a way that speaks to yourself. Um, and I think it also decentered him as the white person handing this tune to me and going, this is something that speaks to you probably different than it speaks to me. So do with it what you want. Um, and so John and I, I think, ended up speaking a common language because we were both playing in the ryth rhythm section um, for such a long time and also for music that was so kind of pivotal to our own kind of core and essence. So I think my inspiration oftentimes comes from that feeling of musical liberation, that I can play what I want to play, how I want to play it, that I'm not concerned with what it looks like from the optics of it. You know, um, th there's, there's expectations I think that people have. I'm sure that Allison has seen many different expectations be like, okay, so you're going to sound like this when I hear you sing. And it's not. And I think people, you know, a, a group that John and I played in for a long time, Columbia Nights, where people will look at three black men and go, I know what your music is going to sound like. And then they hear the record and they go, that's not what I thought it was going to sound like. And I appreciate that, that ability to say, you know, Jamel has been iconoclastic for a long time. How many Chinese rappers do you know that aren't Chinese like Jamel? So I think that there's this, this beauty in the, the ability of black people to say, I want to do what I want to do, which we've always done historically, and have that be accepted as part of canon. It doesn't have to be a whole separate thing. It doesn't have to be alt, whatever. It's, it is it. So when I make R&B music, I'm making R&B music. It's not alternative R&B, it's R&B. So that's uh, a good answer to say, uh, I'm inspired by a lot of things and primarily my blackness and uniqueness in that, in that regard. Go ahead, Allison. I was just gonna say, there's so much that you just said, uh, Jason, that resonated. Um, and I'm sure perhaps all of the musicians on this panelist may feel this way. Um, I know that whenever I've been given the freedom or the liberty to sing or to perform, whether it's an aria, a song or whatever that I choose that speaks to me, I'm a better performer. I, I sing better. I would imagine you, all, you play better. You know what I mean? If, if there's a piece of music that, that speaks to you, um, and it's, it can be different, difficult when you are classically trained because you are given a cer you're given certain things that like, this is how you learn, this is how you grow as in, grow your skills um, as a you know, classical singer, as a drummer, or as a guitarist, or whatever it may be. But when somebody gives you the opportunity to just do what you wanna do, you, uh, you're elevated. Um, and I will also say, I think in the span of a career in general, it takes courage to be able to do that, to start to step out and do you. Because so many things, whether it's in the classical or R&B or hip hop, whatever industry, especially if you're like a managed person, if you have a manager and agents, you're guided. People are telling you what you should do. Um, and so to have the courage to sort of break out and do your own thing, that takes a lot of confidence, frankly, and some seasoning. Uh, to be able to do that. But when you do, it's incredibly liberating. And I do think you become a better artist, creator, producer when you're out, allowed to step out um, and do your own thing. Now, do you think, do you think uh, your Sidwell background 
helped you to adopt that sort of attitude? A, a million percent. Um, I mean, I, a couple of my classmates are on this call <laughs> and they know, um, I mean, I sang like in the choir, but I, in the chorus, but I also like played soccer and was like into all the clubs and was the, you know, the vice president of like the BSU and all this stuff. And let's be real. I did not think opera was cool at all. I did not want folks to know that every Wednesday I would literally leave Sidwell, go to the Levine School of Music, take my voice lesson for an hour, come back to Sidwell. <laughs> so I was like a handful of friends that knew that I did this like opera thing. Um, but I kind of like tried to keep it under wraps. And it was actually my senior year, Mr. Marlowe was our chorus teacher. And I was just chilling out in the alto section. Like I did not want people to know. And he says, Allison, look, I know your real voice. I know what you can really do. I want you to sing for a high school, for like the assembly. And I want you to do your opera thing. I was like, oh my gosh, Mr. Marlowe, I'm gonna get booed off this stage. There is no way I'm gonna do that. No, 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 no. He said, please. So I did it and I sang Mozart's Alleluia, which is just one word. Hallelujah, whatever. But it's like all over the place, high notes, melismas, you name it. I was like, here we go, about to get booed. The whole theater just like erupted. And they're like, Whoa! I was like, oh my God, they don't hate it. And I just remember that feeling of being like, okay, yes, you can be all these other things. You can be an athlete, you can be a scholar, you can be involved in your community. You can also be a musician. You don't have to stay in one lane. Um, and so when I left, uh, when I left Sidwell, I ended up doing a double degree actually at Oberlin, pre-law sociology and voice performance. And I think so much of that, I got that from Sidwell that says, you know, you can be an intellect, you can be all the, those things and also be a musician. And I'm so glad that Sidwell instilled that in me because my other educational background, I use very much to this day, certainly as a producer um, and as a businesswoman. Um, so I'm very grateful for the sort of the, the encouragement of diversity in, in all aspects that I got from Sidwell. Jamel, let me ask you, how, how do you feel Sidwell impacted your career or your choices, your creativity? Yeah, I mean, I was definitely just going to jump in on that thread, Allison. I think so much of what you were talking about um, in terms of both like cultivating an intellectual mind and just like kind of a intellectual curiosity and that and this idea that you can do all of these things, that they aren't, um, you know, isolated fields of study. I mean, I think there was a way in which, you know, you were studying and looking at the same material, whether that was through history class or through English class you know, but from different angles and both examining them through, you know, kind of Socratic seminars. And I think there was a way in a lot of the interstitial and the hidden curricula that actually, sh you know, uh, seeded the ground for, uh, I think, uh, multidisciplinary approaches to performance and to music, and also looking at the sociological function actually of all of that. You know, what is the place and the role of music in society, of culture in society? How does it actually train people to think and how do you move people forward? You know, I think some of the experiences that are and, and part of what, um, you know, part of the like imposter syndrome sitting on the shoulder over here, you know, was like when at Sidwell in terms of music, that that was not the lane that I was in in particular uh, as far as like chorus or, you know, we would, we, you know, but it was something on stage you know, um, we would do like performances. I'm like thinking back like drums, bass and Jamel, we did like a, uh, performances at like talent shows. Um, but I think this thing, you know, of finding one's voice, you know, meeting for worship, you know, and the kind of, you know, stage and space that that, that, that actually presented, um, you know, and then also I, I think the overall structure, like I, I, I link and remember so fondly the experience of like, the Go-Go's and bringing Go-Go music and bands that we rocked with in, like in Southeast, you know, bringing them out. Like, yo, this is my favorite band from middle school. Like, and they're about to play like at high school and bringing these worlds together and bringing, you know, uh, really learning to kind of be uh, a bridge and, and, and look at culture as a way of like bringing people together. I think there are ways that like 
outside of the kind of official curricula, there was all the kind of unofficial and official that really built that. And so, but yeah, this thing of, you know, you don't have, these aren't isolated things or isolated pursuits. You know, we, and, and please, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. We, we have a, a question there that I'd like to try to elaborate a little bit more on. Um, Allison mentioned sort of her fusing of genres and, and you know, JD similarly, and obviously Jamel, you know, a, a Mandarin rapper, but I can recall, you know, the initial, you know, back for me, you know, King Tim the Third, Fat Back, and Sugar Hill, and the beginning of, of, of rap, and 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 now here we are, you know, years later, and and rap and hip hop have now really become almost mainstream in their uh, impact on the on the industry. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, because it, it seemed at initially was it was very dismissive. It was, ah, well, that's rap music. Or you had stations that even said, we're not going to play rap music. And now it's almost, uh, as I said, so mainstream. And obviously it, it does come from, from a, 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 cult, a place, place of black culture. Um, I guess I'll come to you, Jamel, first, but I also, I'd also like to hear what you have to say. Uh, not to say that I don't want to hear from you, JD or Jason, either. But uh, we'll start. We'll start with J Jamal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, like, I mean, I even these conversations. I'm excited to see like rap opera up in this, you know. And so I think that's going to be like super exciting. And you know, of course, you know, JD and 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 Jason are, you know, deep hip hop heads of scholarship. And so. Um, I mean, I, I think it, we're at an interesting period, right? Where like even the uh, of like the internationalization of hip hop, where I think this question really points to of like the as a dominant cultural force. When you look at like the culture that undergirds youth culture, popular youth culture right now, that's hip hop culture. That's um, you know in its approach, and you, you have a situation right now where like the largest artists in the world actually aren't even necessarily rapping in English. You know, you have like K-pop bands, you know, um, and um, uh, and Bad Bunny are like the largest, you know, artists in the world right now, music artists in the world right now. And so I think we really are at a point where you, you have and have seen the ability of hip hop culture to actually be able to like absorb these other sounds to work with and, you know, to sample and remix, you know, other sounds and other styles, you know, uh, while at the same time, there is also the rise and the extreme rise and promotion of like, you know, the commercial industry behind hip hop, right? And, you know, and, and that at times, right, can also be problematic, but all of these things actually, I think related to its really global dominance and explosion right now, um, I think, you know, we're living at an age now, especially when it regards to like internet and meme culture and memetics, where, you know, again, the the OGs and that the, the, the cultural estuary and foundation that that's like on, you know, is hip hop culture. You know, people are passing around memes of, you know, of Diddy, of OGs of hip hop culture, of DJ Khaled, you know, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, doing that at a rapid pace that actually has joined, you know, people are doing, I think Childish Gambino is an amazing example of this and that This Is America video where you have dances from South Africa that have gone viral that are being, you know, uh, right up next to people, you know, uh, Millie rocking and doing a dances from America, right? And just that just shows this like internationalization of it. Look, you know, but I think the main precipice that we're coming up with, right, and in even the question of it is, what is this going to be used for? Will it just be used for more commercialization and the creation of more billionaires? And, and is black capital the answer to black liberation? You know, I would actually argue not, right? And we're actually at a moment now with all the technology and connections at our disposal and the ethos that hip hop has presented and the art form that it is as like a tool to be able to kind of create this content to actually really break that apart and actually really start to ask this question around reform or revolution. And so I'm excited about, you know, kind of pushing hip hop, you know, as a, a, a vehicle of cultural diplomacy. Um, but, you know, I think it's a really fascinating question and I'm, I'm super excited to hear you guys' takes on it as well. <laughs> well, and Allison, I'd like you to speak to, he used a term that I, I, I think was very powerful, that it absorbs these other genres. And uh, if you could speak to that a little. Absolutely. Um... I mean, I think one of the 
to, about hip hop in general, it's not just a musical genre, as Jamel said, it is a culture now. And I think that's the thing that cannot be ignored within, within our culture in general, or society in general, it can't be ignored. Because remember, it started like rap and hip hop, it started off as like this tiny little category at the Grammys, however many decades ago, right? And it was not aired on television. It was just like, ah, maybe we'll have this category for this year. And then now where we are, it's like a main part of, of the Grammys, right? It has become a part of our culture and it can't be ignored. In terms of the musical aspect of it all, you know, classic, if you listen to hip hop, if you listen to pop, if you listen to classic rock, and you really listen to the themes, you will hear Mozart, you will hear Beethoven, you will hear Tchaikovsky. There's a reason why that music has lasted the test of time. It is grand, you have, there is a visceral reaction to it. There are chord structures, there's the way that the harmonies go from one thing to the other. It's very powerful. It's why classical music, you hear it as the backdrop for you know so many uh, things in movies and commercials. It has a staying power, right? And so if you listen to any genre of music, you're gonna hear some of those, those um, classical undertones if you know classical music. So I think to fuse the two, to fuse say hip hop with, with, with opera, it makes sense. I was in the studio a couple of years ago, um, actually he's a, um, a, a jazz drummer um, and a pianist, James Francis, I don't know if you guys know him, but he plays um, a lot with the, uh, with the Roots and he's friends with Quest. And, um, we we brought in a, a young up and coming rapper and then we had the hook was like an operatic thing. it was the coolest thing ever and it just made sense because you had this just like this very you know he's rapping and it's very like approachable and you can hear every single word you know what the message is and then this chorus would come in that was just like this soaring operatic line but it went with the feeling of what he was rapping about and so i think those types of and it just, it made you feel a certain way. You got, you know, you got the chills. And so I think it's actually organic and people just need to be willing to think outside of the box because when the, when the fusion comes together, it actually makes musical sense. Um, and so I think it's just gonna take a lot of, I think it's gonna take artists, frankly, just thinking out of the box and having the courage to do so. And we're gonna start seeing a lot, a lot more of it. Yeah, Jason, I gotta ask you, I mean, are your kids going to be thinking juvenile is an oldie but goodie? <laughs> I mean, probably. It's, it's funny because right now, my son's favorite song is probably uh, Remind Me by Patricia Thrushing. Um, it's very strange, but that's his favorite song. Like, I turn it on in the car and, and he'll start. He's two years old, but he's like, that's the song he wants to dance to. Now, that's not the only music we listen to, obviously. And, and I think I, we hear music through our parents first because we can't turn on the stereo ourselves. But I, I will say that I think some of hip hop's staying power um, is also kind of Jamel alluded to this. In I think that rap purists exist, and there's, there's genre purists of every type, and they're always going to be kind of people who are the genre gatekeeper. But ultimately, I think hip hop culture and hip hop music is uh, ubiquitous because it is um, all encompassing and also welcoming to something else. It's a music that is based on a pastiche of other things. I think anytime you have that, you're going to run into a genre that goes, yeah, you're here. And it's also a, a subculture of kind of misfit kids. These are, these are, this is a youth cultural music and a youth culture music will almost always exist. To Jamel's point, popularization of this, commodification of it happens. And I might hear a classical theme more often in a car commercial than I will on the radio. And yes. it'll make me want to buy the Lexus. It ain't going to make me want to buy a hamburger maybe. Uh, so I'm going to use, you know, a hip hop slogan for that. I'm going to use my bada ba ba ba. I'm using black music. Yeah, you know, exactly. Music. Black American music has been used and kind of twisted and conformed to what you know capitalist structures structures wanted to do. It also exists as a countercurrent all the time. And hip hop is a good example of that. There's kind of always the two sides. There's the mainstream. There's the underground. Kind of we call it that. But you know, those things aren't really as divided as we might think. I was one of the kids who I felt like I was a straight up purist for a while, going, you know. <laughs> I only want to listen to somebody who's, you know, the backpacker rap. Like, if, if he's not conscious, then I don't listen to him. I'm going, you know what? This is kind of whack because everybody's conscious to some extent. All music, to any any worthwhile music, in my opinion, is something that reflects a lot of things. I I, uh, uh, <laughs> I had a conversation once with somebody. I asked her what kind of music she wanted to listen to. She said, anything that's uplifting or wants me to shake my ass. And I was like, 
I can understand that. I, I can understand <laughs> both those things exist. I want music that's gonna make me want to be uplifted. I want music to also make my because maybe shaking my ass makes me feel uplifted. So I think that was the whole thing about the whole twerking and stuff. And like I don't think it's a problem because if that music make if my music makes somebody want to twerk, good. If my music makes you want to feel liberated and take down establishment, good. Those things are all both you know good in my opinion. But uh, but I will say that I'm concerned about that certain music becomes a closed canon, right? I think we had this conversation with jazz years ago about what is really jazz and what is not. The gatekeeper says it can't be. What is hip hop and what is not? You know, Allison ran into people saying that's not opera. Well, who says? If I have a librettist and I have a score, it's an opera. If nobody says any words and we all sing them, it's an opera. I don't care what you tell me it is, it's an opera. I, I think that the better, we're better off when we don't gatekeep what a genre does and when we're more welcome with saying, this is something that's also part of this without making a whole like new alt name for it. Genres in general to me seem feel they feel outdated at some point. Um, but we're looking at a hip hop culture and that hip hop culture is gonna stay around indefinitely in my opinion, because it's what it, it it's it's one, always changing and evolving, whether we like it or not. And two, it's connected to people who felt disenfranchised. And unfortunately, there's always gonna be people who feel disenfranchised, and that is the music I gravitate toward. When I wanna, you know, tear down the establishment, I'm looking public enemy, I may not want to listen to, you know, Kathy Klein. That's not gonna happen. So it is, it's, you know, I, I think there's a reason that hip hop stays around and it's not going anywhere, so. No, I, I, I understand that. I, I remember when uh, uh, Snoop's first album came out uh, and uh, I was married at the time and I would, I would always have to listen to it when she wasn't around because it made me feel particularly misogynist, you know, and there's sometimes you just wanted to, to feed into that. Sorry, Allison. But um, so JD, I, working off of something that, that Jason was just speaking about, sort of hip hop uh, music as a form of a uh, protest, if you will, but, but music in general throughout the history has, has, has had a role in uh, sparking discussions about civil rights or, or uh, promoting causes. How, how has, particularly this last year, do you think, um, has impacted uh, not only what you do, but the, the industry in general? Yeah, um, I think last year, especially when I think back to, you know, the protests in the summer time, especially, I think that was definitely like a moment for a lot of artists. You kind of had to like make a decision like, okay, where if you hadn't already been rapping about social injustice, like, were you going to do it now? Like when it was on everyone's radar or were you going to just kind of like sidestep it or kind of be quiet and just kind of disappear in the side until it's like everything opens up again. So I think, um, you know, it's been like really inspiring to kind of see a lot of these artists kind of take moments to like really engage with the conversation, maybe in ways like further than they had it before, or either like if they hadn't been that focused, they're taking an opportunity to like really kind of talk about it further. Um, sorry, what was the original question again? It was. Um, I'm sorry, caught myself on mute. Uh, how uh, music has been a platform for uh, expressing about civil rights or protest. Um, and in light of the past year, what, the, what that impact has had. Yeah, no, I think, no, I think it's great. Cause I think one thing I've always thought about is with music is that, you know, the joy of music is that like, you can really um, instill a message or bring up a topic in a way that's like kind of more, it's like more challenging to discuss in like plain words. Um, you know, when I hear, um, you know, Nina Simone sing or, you know, even like more recent artists like Kendrick or like Anderson Pack, you know, they, you know, when I hear them rap or sing about like certain like really challenging situations or experiences, I feel like for folks who like maybe hadn't considered a certain perspective or view it like this is an opportunity to then be like, oh, okay, so this is like what, you know, Black folks experience. It's like this is an opportunity for me to like really kind of reflect and think about like my actions and how am I participating in this or like how am I helping and like just things like that. I think, yeah, I think it's like great that like, you know, there are artists who like take an opportunity to like discuss these things that are kind of harder to kind of discuss in like a proper like kind of discussion or format. You know, I think it, I think the great thing about music is it brings these topics that are challenging for some folks into kind of like a mainstream or like dinner table conversation. Did anybody else want to speak to that? I saw some heads nodding. 
think music is a good example of, of when um, art gets to imitate life. Um, I think that the the beauty of listening to music, I, I am uh, now recovering because of the, the, the COVID pandemic, a, a record shopper, enthusiast, collector, over my, like way too much, way too many records in my house. But one of the joys that I have about record shopping, kind of crate digging, is the connection to one physical space, right? Having a physical thing, but also kind of the temporal time of this record being released. So there is like a political moment, a historical moment that coincides with the record being made. So you can't listen to a record from, you know, 1971 and not know that it's 1971. Like, you know, when, like a good example to me is, um, you know, uh, Sly's record, there's a ride going on, right? This is a direct response to Marvin Gaye's album, What's Going On? He's like, nigga, you don't know what's going on. There's a riot going on. I'm telling you what's going on. So Marvin does this in this kind of sensual crooner way saying, you know, guys are coming back from Vietnam talking about war as hell, when will it end? And, you know, Sly's talking about, you know, I, we might need to go back to Africa. Thank you for talking to me, Africa. Like, this is, this is a very interesting kind of um, commentary on what happens at the time. And I think that whether we consider it's true or not, I think almost all music does that, whether we want to call them like these iconic records or not. I think, you know, an album that comes out in, in 2019 can be informed by the pandemic by in a lot of ways, right? It, it can be informed by, you know, um, police brutality in a lot of ways. It may not, those words may not be specifically saying that, but I think that you can draw through lines to why certain records are released at certain times and why certain people want to say things. And I think any most music with a timely message, it doesn't have to be everything's not going to be Kurt Mayfield, right? But certain things will feel timely because maybe it's just a relinquishing and throwing up my hands and saying, I don't want this anymore. Like, that's also a, a response to what's happening in the world. It may not be, you know, a, a fight the power. It may be, a, you know, I feel tired. Like, these are these are all responses to what's happening. And I think music, like JD says, is a great way of saying that without it coming off as sometimes preachy or coming off as, as, um, as kind of overtly ham-handed or, or, or closed-fisted to say, this is how it's gonna be, or, or it's, it's not grandstanding almost. When you put music behind something, there's a way for you to hear it in a way. This, this, this is to me why I like opera so much, is that I, I was never a musical theater person because I felt like it's this weird suspension of disbelief between when someone's talking and when someone's singing. So it's like, I wanna say something to you, but now I wanna sing it to you. You're like, no, no, wait, wait a second. I thought we were talking. And now everybody knows the dance moves and like, it's weird to me. But what I love is opera because we communicate in song. When I sing to you, you sing to me, and I sing to him, and I'm singing about something like that consistency of language and of the, the way that it is being passed, to me is a beauty, it's the beauty of it, because you can talk about one well, of my favorite opposites, Tristan and Zola. There's some really sad things that are being said, but you accept it because it's being said in song. I wouldn't necessarily want people to say those words out loud, but in song, it's like, I can deal with this. I can, I can, I can get through the ring of the needle. It's like recording in progress. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like I like that sung versus spoken. I think that you get a different gravity to it. So yeah, That's Jason, I have to tell. You, I'm sorry. I just want to real quick. I'll never forget West Side Story when I was a kid. That was a big, and I remember watching it. And you know, to your point, I'm like, okay, he's out on the balcony and they're supposed to be quiet, and all of a sudden he's like, Maria, I just met this guy, and I'm like, wait, dude, like, shh, be quiet. Or when they're gonna fight, the knife fight, like you're gonna have a no, fight. Yeah. fight. That's my favorite it's part. Like Michael Jackson video. It's, when it's the be. best part. It's the best <laughs> part. <laughs> okay. I, I, wa I wanted to just like add to what to what a lot of what Jason was saying, um, and you know, this opera that I was supposed to have was supposed to be in March of 2020. Yes, I was supposed to start rehearsals then. I dream um, at Opera Carolina. And I was already excited. I was an honor to be portraying, you know, Coretta Scott King in this in this piece. Then 2020 happened. The summer happened. The show got postponed. And now we're set to uh, premiere now in September of 2021. And now I feel a whole other sense of weight and gravity in portraying and in presenting this opera and presenting this story because it was already an important story, but it's even heavier now. And, um, you know, the story, even though it's about the last 36 hours of his life, it's a series of flashbacks about his life. And the composer did not shy away from showing the humanity and the flaws of Martin Luther King. 
And he was worried at first, he said, are people going to be upset with me for not simply telling the story of a hero and sort of the, um, not the fantasy, but just sort of like the highlight reel of his life and not showing sort of like the nitty gritty and what went on like in his marriage and the struggles and those sorts of things. And he also struggled with what to call this opera because in it, I sing jazz, I, there are some sort of bluesy tones to it, definitely some R&B and opera. And so I was on a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago and they said, ask the composer, so why have you chosen to label this a musical drama and not an opera or not an R&B opera or not a jazz opera? He said, because titles, categories, they're gonna confuse people and they're gonna make people apprehensive. They're gonna come in already with an idea of, well, this is kind of what I'm expecting to hear. And they'll come in with a preconceived notion. He was like, musical drama is so open-ended. He said, will people leave the theater going, wow, that had a lot of jazz and R&B in there along with opera and that was cool. Will people probably end up labeling it that? Sure, he's like, but let them come to that conclusion on their own. Because as people, unfortunately, we do have this like need and desire to put everything in a box and to label. Um, but when you don't, it gives people the freedom to just experience it however they're gonna experience it with an open mind. And so I'm very intrigued to see how audiences respond uh, to this show, just coming in knowing, okay, here's, an, here's a musical drama about the last 36 hours of MLK's life. And uh, wow, okay, but now I'm hearing all these different things. I'm very interested to see how audiences will respond. And again, to your point, it's about music has this ability to give a message in a, in a way that um, I think people are just more comfortable because they know they're there to be entertained. So they come in more willing versus saying, okay, you're coming into a lecture or a discussion or a speech about such and such. It's like, okay, I'm coming to hear a show. I'm coming to, to I'm sitting down to listen to something. You're a little bit more relaxed. And I think people are then more receptive to whatever that message is that you are sending with the music. So I think that's a, that's a powerful aspect of, of being a musician and of creating art with a message. Now, have, have any of you others found this past year particular challenges because of COVID? Has it affected you in, in, in whether negative or positive? Yeah. I mean, I was supposed to do a full summer tour last summer 2020. And then also I was gonna work with another artist and do probably a four month tour following that. So I had a whole year of like tours lined up that have all gotten like canceled or postponed. Um, but the great thing about it is that like now we have all this time to record. And so like with the artists I've been working with, you know, we've been writing collectively, we probably have like four or five albums of stuff like written and we're in the process of recording it um, over the next like several months, which has been nice to get that free time to actually dig into the stuff that we normally wouldn't get to because we're performing. Yeah. How about you, Jamel? Oh, oh, Jason, go for it. I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump in right I after you go. I didn't agree yeah. with JD, but uh, I wasn't touring as heavily, but I think it, it, the kind of rinse and receipt, receipt, rinse and repeat cycle of, you know, record, tour, record, tour, like we'll record, release, tour, record, release, tour. To me, that, that we're showing, it's we're being shown right now that there's something wrong with that. That can't be the only way that, that things exist. So I think what I'm interested in and kind of what's going to be intriguing now is what sort of new, to Jamel's point earlier, like what sort of new things come out of this? So what sort of new existence of the music sphere comes out of, you know, not necessarily being able to sit into a packed nightclub and play, um, not being able to tour multi-city tours. And like, that's not gonna happen the same way, at least in my opinion, it's not gonna happen the same way anymore. Um, and so I'm curious about what happens specifically to the art itself, this time to kind of steep in something, um, what comes out of this and how it's maybe different than what we've kind of commoditized into this package. No, you're, you're certainly right. I mean, obviously the impact on, on arts venues has been tremendous. Uh, I, look, I'm a big fan of the, the North Sea Jazz Festival. I would go every summer. It's very difficult for me to picture how they can conduct something like that uh, going forward. Anyway, Jamel, you were getting ready to jump in there. 
Oh, yeah. No, I, I just was going to say, yeah, I think this is a moment where like the world stopped and actually had to really deal with and reconcile with this. You know, I mean, for myself personally, I was, I was planning to I had just come back from a, a tour in 2019 in China, was planning to return back in the summer of 2020 to set up another tour on the heels of that, continue to do work. Uh, um, I uh, received a fellowship for USC, a, a civic media fellowship. Um, and so it would have been back and forth between LA. I mean, and I think all of that really had to, we had to figure out how to do that in a more, in like in a remote fashion. But I think it did really present this challenge to everyone, right? Where like, where we were all looking at and the problem of coronavirus and COVID and where people are being trained to think about this scientifically. And in the middle of that, you have, you know, George Floyd, you know, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of that occurring, you know, and, and people seeing that people seeing Derek Chauvin strangling the life out of this person and neat and trying to come to grips with kind of trying to understand what kind of a world would do that and people adopting all kinds of methods of thinking in order to do that. Right. Um, a lot of it unscientific. Right. But we're at a moment now and a challenge now where we can really, you know, look we can use and adopt a scientific method and a scientific process to look at these large problems in the world. And music and culture can help us get there. You know, I think we we had a, a a reckoning. People called this summer like the racial reckoning of America, right? And that was on top of a pandemic, on top of a fascist insurrection, right? And you know that in in dealing with all of that, it's we are at a I think a moment right now where musically we're both the forms that these things take shape in will need to change, right? And you're seeing some of that in the space with like you know. Uh, with like you know Blau and NFTs being sold and in the in the privatization and commodification of like art as a as a social unit, um, but then you're also seeing it in terms of artists being their feet being held to the fire in ways that hasn't ever been happened before, right? And culture actually shifting this conversation around it. Um, but I think it's it it will be a situation where we'll have to kind of we'll really have to continue that um, as artists. And I think I don't know I'm excited to be kind of you know, in this period, creating work. Um, and I agree with JD, yeah, definitely it's, it's been a time to like record, to dive in, but it's also been a time to, to you know, to get out into the streets and to work with people and to have that feedback process, um, you know, to find new ways to carve out that kind of feedback process, live streams and, um, and connecting with folks online and like really trying to close that gap. But I definitely agree with Jason, like those things and those models are, are going to change. And we're witnessing, I think, in a bit of a little bit of a title shift around that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think obviously things are having to shift. Um, I don't know. I think it's going to be quite some time before we go, before we're back in, you know, theaters at full capacity and people, you know, cheering. And it's it's going to be still a little ways. I mean, I know for, for a fact, Broadway is not actually reopening until 2022. Um, you know, they're saying, oh, we're going to be at this capacity, that capacity. There's no Broadway theater that can sustain um, putting up a production when audiences are only at 30 percent because it is a ticket market um, profit model. And so there's just no way to sustain it. Um, and I will say just, you know, I was reading Lori's question earlier specifically about how how I as an artist just responded to the pandemic and, I'll, and how it affected my artistry and my desire to create. Um, and to be perfectly honest, it, it was a gut punch. Um, I just remember that first or that second week in March, I got the notification, okay, Allison, North Carolina, canceled. Two weeks later, Allison, Kennedy Center, canceled. Two weeks later, Allison, your summer, canceled. And it was just one thing after the next. and. I think my sort of my career is a little bit different than the other gentlemen on this panel and that I'm literally on the road probably about nine months out of the year. I go from one opera, I'm there for about a month. I may come home for a week, switch out my suitcase. I'm on to another city or another country, another production. I'm there for a month. And that's, that's my life, right? And I, I'm used to having no downtime and it's just one gig after the next. I live in hotel rooms and in theaters. And so, and I've done this for 20 years. And so within the span of three weeks to a month to every other day, every other day, basically having an agent say, your industry and your career is over as we know it, you have zero work. Um, I found it, I mean, it was tough. 
I did not sing a note. I did not practice a nothing for about two months. And I have a whole studio and a practice room in my apartment in New York. I did not press turn on the electric keyboard to do a me, 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 me. I was like, nothing. I just, I was really down and I was like, what is happening? And then I snapped out of it. Um, but it's only because I knew that I had this other project as a producer and a creator that I thought, and I talked with my partner, I said, okay, we have got to use all this time to our advantage. No, we're not going to have a show, a live show that's opening in November anymore, but now we've got to pivot. And that's when the creative juices started flowing as a producer and saying, okay, let's put together these these interesting mashups. Let's start putting out music videos that aren't COVID videos where everybody's just in a square, but producing like really high quality music videos. And that has been my driving force throughout this entire thing. Um, I, you know, I, I'm hosting this gala tomorrow for Levine, but on Wednesday, I was at the, the ARC um, theater doing my pre-tape of my performance that's going to be tomorrow night. Just to be on a stage in a gown <laughs> with like lipstick and like, you know, jewels and all this kind of stuff. It was an audience of five people and a camera crew of two. And I was like, I'm happy to sing for you all. <laughs> like, it was so, I just, it made me so happy because those moments are so few and far between, but to be able to just like emote and express in that way, um, I've been missing it. And I know all of my colleagues who are so used to being on a stage every single day have been really missing it. So it's been an emotional, it's definitely been an emotional journey for sure. Oh, no, thank you for sharing. I, I, I want to ask this. Now, all of you, as far as I'm concerned, you know, you're, you're, you're young people. But I think if I do the math, you, all of you are now on the north side of 30. So how, how do you think about the next generation? the youth, I mean, and, and, and how do you, and are, are, are you teaching youth? And, and what sort of responsibility do you think you have for, for instilling in them um, not only a love of the genre, but, but maybe, you know, how to form and shape it? And, and Jason, I, I'm gonna come to you. I, I, you, you, I think, no, have some, some insight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, uh, so I'm, I'm a new parent but I've been in the education world for the last ooh, 14 years or so. Um, and so I spent a lot of time, um, sometimes teaching music specifically, uh, sometimes teaching other things with music infused. So I was an English teacher for most of my career, um, but also taught history, also taught um, uh, some theater, also taught some music. And I also have students that are private lessons for, um, for piano and for drums. Um, so I say I have to say, I've always felt like that is a part of my responsibility is imparting um, not just wisdom, but appreciation for something that is oftentimes seen as only um, helpful because of something else that it does, right? When we talk about cutting music from public schools, people argue, and go, well, it makes people so much better at math. Yes, but it also is art. And I think it has value in and of itself. And we don't need to like make it piggyback on something else in order for it to not get cut. Anyway, I do find myself, um, I used to have conversations with students, you know, after the bell rang about whatever I was playing in the background in class, right? Um, or um, having conversations about what kids are listening to right now. So they want to come to me and show me on YouTube the thing they didn't listen to or what, I mean, that's how I knew about DC rappers that I had heard about, you know, I didn't only knew about Shy Glizzy because of my students listening to Shy Glizzy. Like that was one of the things like there's, there's and to me, the the kind of fervor and, 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 and kind of uh, rabid desire for kids to share music is something that's like across the board universal. And, and, and to me, it felt, you know, reminiscent of my own middle school careers of, of what Jamal referenced, right? The, the early high school days of digging through, you know, dollar bin CD bins at CD exchange and finding this CD and that CD and that sort of thing. Um, I, I also think that um, from my perspective of like um, personal students or private lessons, I'm listening to, I think Matt's question earlier in the chat. Um, I, I do think that um, the way that I was taught piano almost crushed my desire to play music um, at the very beginning of my career. And I think that's true for a lot of black musicians is that we're taught music in a way that makes your blackness almost an impediment to the way that music should be done. Your, your, your natural kind of um, existence 
flavor, timbre, soul, all these things are almost like you need to get rid of that in order to play this, right? This is Chopin. This is not, you know, Art Tatum. And so I always felt like, man, you're telling me, you know, in, in so many words that I don't belong in this music. And so it made me make a choice to say, well, maybe this is not music I want to play anymore. And I, I honestly haven't um, taught Western classical music in a long time or played it myself. Um, Cause sitting at the piano to me, I think there's still some like trauma attached to that. It's, you know, the back straight and the elbows up and the, and it was zero fun. And to me, I think one of the things that I ask students before I take them on is, as, as uh, music students is, what do you want to get out of this? I asked them and I asked their parents. And oftentimes there are two different answers, right? Um, I, I think that parents oftentimes want the straight back fingers curved, professional, I want you to do this so that you'll be good in this. And then I can put this on your resume and you can go to this school. And the kids are like, I like that song on the radio and I don't want to play that. And to me, I go, that's, that's what I was getting at. I want you to have this kind of tool. This, I look at like teaching literacy. I'm not, if I teach you how to read and you use that ability to read and write to do something I don't agree with, that's on you. That, that, I, have, that I can't control and police how you learn or what you use this tool for. And I look at music similarly. I want you to get whatever you want out of this thing. So there is, to me, a diasporic tradition of teaching you know, um, music that is not going to be seen in a lot of Western published books. There are a bunch of Hal Leonard books about how to teach the drums, and I read them, and then I went, no, I don't want to do some, a lot of these things. I, my lesson that I had with a student just yesterday, you know, we're sitting on this patio, he has his drum set up, and I said, today, I don't even want to touch the drum kit until we sing for a little while. And we sat there, and we beatboxed, beatboxed back to each other. I beatboxed him, he beatboxed back to me. Then I say, okay, we're going to play this pattern, and I'm going to beatbox it first, and then you're going to beatbox it back to me, and then you're going to play it. And to me, there's, an, there's a, a, a core of my essence that is going to be connected to music in that way. And to this boys as well, that made a whole level of our practice just open up because I wasn't going, the book says we do this now. And the book says go to this. Like, we can play paradiddles all day. But if you can't tell me what you're hearing in your ear and what's going to come out in your hands, then we lost a whole big like chunk of what culturally we do. We spoke through the drums. And I want to speak through the drums with you right now in this moment. Thank you very much. Jamal, are, are you, is your time? I think our time is up in general. I, you know, I... I I hate being constrained by time. You know, I've never worn a watch in my life. And we can go into a whole nother rabbit hole about defining what time is and being a man-made parameter to control our lives. But that's a whole nother discussion for, for a different- That's a Eurocentric view of life. We, we, we're on a black panel. We don't have to be so Eurocentric tied to what happens. Hey, uh, but J Jamel, was there anything that you wanted to say before you had to, had to Jump. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I do have to jet. I'm loving this conversation so much, man. Really, really. I mean, first off, you know, shout out to you, Neville, for hosting this awesome discussion and to all of the, uh, you know, panelists, Allison, Jason, JD, homies, um, and everybody who is in the room. You know, this has been super riveting and, and catching up with all the comments. Um, just on the on the plug of, of education, like I think, you know, so much of music and hip hop culture and education, we think about all the things that society, how society rewards hip hop culture outside of academic institutions, right? And uses it and, you know, to sell and, you know, selling, you know, hip hop cupcakes and, you know, but while at the same time inside is inside of these institutions is treated as something that's uh, a distraction or worse from learning. And it's actually a vehicle, you know, both for learning, as I was saying, but then also for research practice, for, for architecture, you know, your, for design thinking right, uh, for cultural diplomacy. I mean, I think this application when we look at like music, music culture, and in particular hip hop culture and youth culture, um, you, you know, it's actually adaptable in all of these kinds of ways. And so I think, you know, that's a lot of, you know, I work a lot in the practice of like culturally responsive pedagogy and in, in New York City and, um, uh, and have over the past 10 years and teaching like using hip hop and the culture of hip hop, not just the music. So not just like writing music about history and Chinese, which I've done, but but using the approaches of it and, you know, as ways that you're actually assessing students, right? As Jason was saying, beatbox this back to me. All right, well, you know, can you, you know, beatbox for me how you felt, how you think uh, uh, slaves were feeling at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, right? And having students, all right, make a meme out of that for me. You know, using the approaches actually of that hip hop culture has of a um, in 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 having young people like show what they know, but through these different ways. Um, but I think it gives us access to all of that. And again, I'm super super honored to be on this panel and to and to connect with all of you guys. Um, and 
let's continue this conversation. You can find me at everywhere at Jam No Peanut, J A M N O P E A N U T. It's a real peanut allergy. Um, and with that, I'm I'm gonna dip out, and I'll catch you guys soon. Thank you so much, Jamel. Before no we get, a, I'd like to get a last word from from each of you. JD, do you have any any final words you'd like to share? Um, no, I just want to say it's been an honor to to be invited on this panel to to hear y'all. Um, and to like share the space, like, you know, it's really, I think, you know, it's always good to kind of like gain some perspective, like outside of school, uh, uh, sit well to kind of see like where other folks are at. Um, but also just like realize like we're all in this community. Um, so I appreciate, you know, being invited, but also being uh, sharing the space with y'all. Jason, any final words? Um, one, one thing is, uh... I think when you ask the question about kind of how the pandemic and the new circumstances that kind of changed the way that we make art or that sort of thing, um, I want to encourage people who are, you know, viewing the panel. Um, I think I sometimes speak so at, so much as a practitioner that like never from the beginning, the lens of a listener is the important lens. Like that's how we get paid is because it's listeners. And I think that people oftentimes don't consider themselves as artistic or musical or talented in some way or creative or whatever it is. Um, but I would say that I'm, I'm inspired by all these sorts of things that aren't specifically music per se. Um, you know, I know Lori is a painter. She's here. Um, Kai sings also. She's also our, our midwife. Um, and I've actually started taking up uh, cooking in the last two years. We're cooking more seriously in the last two years. I always cooked, but I feel like now is the time to, I'm not out here, you know, touring. So how can I put this creativity on a plate instead of putting it necessarily, you know, in a drum solo? Um, so I guess I want to say that to encourage other people to like do something similar, right? If you can't do this thing, get your creative kind of, you know, urges satisfied with something else. And for me, it's been food recently. So I think that uh, I just had to say, I, I want that to continue for everyone and, and to not pigeonhole yourself about how we view music um, or how we view art in general. And, and Allison, a final word from you. Um, it's just been, it's been wonderful to be on this panel and um, I just feel an overwhelming sense of Sidwellness, of Sidwell community. Um, you know, I haven't met, you know, any of you before being on this panel, but I, I do just, I really do feel a sense of community in terms of how all of us have just this wealth of, of, of talent and diversity um, and an openness to our thinking. Um, and expressing ourselves and a willingness to share that I have found like really invaluable. And I'm, and I'm grateful to all the people who've been watching this panel. And it's just been, um, it's, uh, it's inspired and it's soothed my soul just to be, just to engage actually in this discussion. And I think it's one that's so important to have and, um, and to continue, to continue um, having talks like these and inspiring one another, because you never know sort of, I don't know what you might hear, what you might say, what you might glean from from anybody. Um, and I've just found this to be very powerful and I'm grateful to have been on the panel. So thank you. Well, well thank you. I, I'm, I'm honored to have been here to, to share this. And, and you know, it, it, I'm going to go listen to my mixtape now that that I, I have, you know, everything from from Morgan Whalen to Queen Herbie. I'm like and or, 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 or whoop D, you know, I'm. I'm all about it. So this has been a great joy. I think you've offered some wonderful insight. Um, I, I think this has been a wonderful um, entire weekend. It's not over yet. And please join uh, for the rest of the things. I know Anna has some, some wrap ups to say. But again, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. This has been uh, really, a, I, I've just been, a, it, it, I can't even find the words. I really appreciate all of you so very much. Thank you for being here. We have a meeting for worship coming up at three o'clock and then some community time following the meeting. So if you have time, uh, please join us for those. And a huge thank you to our panelists uh, for being here and Neville for leading us. And we'll see you at the next thing shortly. Thank you.